then let's launch into this. We stopped somewhere around here last time where we were introducing some, we went through levels of organization. We listed the characteristics that separate living things from non-living things. So I was going to grab a rock from outside and just set a rock down uh, and stand here next to the rock and let, maybe we can just do this with our brain and think, you know, how would I be different from the rock or from this water bottle that's sitting right here? That's not alive versus me being alive. We listed some characteristics that, that life has, one of which we get to extrapolate on today, and that's this, this process of evolution. We said living organisms reproduce, and in doing so, there's something unique about how they reproduce that, that makes them a biological system, and that is in, in biology, in, in life as we know it, as living things reproduce, they pass down that DNA molecule from one generation to the next. And that, that molecule gets altered slightly from one generation to the next. You know, that's, that's different than, uh, I've heard sometimes people describe that fire can, can grow and reproduce. And if I light these notes on fire and then turn around and light, light your class notes on fire, you could turn around and then light his class notes on fire and the fire could, you know, you could spread it all the way to the back corner. And if that's the case, if we, if we went back here and we saw your spiral notebook is burning now, there's nothing that we could tell about that fire that would tell us the lineage of how that fire jumped from one page to the next because the fire is not passing down that DNA molecule from one offspring to the next. And in biological systems, that does happen. So we can trace this heredity from one generation to the next. And if you've had your DNA mapped or anything like that, you can see how they can trace that heredity of a DNA molecule as it moves around the globe. It's crazy to think that, like I said, all life as we know it is made out of cells. And they're, of all the different types of cells, they are, uh, they fall into one of these three categories, these three domains of life. If that's too washed out, uh, the, the first box here represents a, a group of cells that we call bacteria or U bacteria. This just means true bacteria. There is a group of organisms called archaea or sometimes referred to as extreme bacteria. And then you've got the last group, which is eukarya. If that's too difficult to read, these same three domains you can see in this slide. I think this gives us a little bit more information. It shows us the three individual domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. So all life that we know of is comprised of cells. Cells fall into these three categories, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. We'll see something interesting you can see with these branch points is that archaea, these extreme bacteria, share a more recent common ancestor with this eukarya group than they do with bacteria. So eukarya and archaea, we are more closely related to archaea than we would be these bacteria. Animals, our group, is just one branch of this eukarya domain. In comparing the three domains, you can see eukarya is the most broad of the three domains. We'll spend some time talking about plants, animals, and fungus, the things that you might be familiar with. But this other group, protists, make up a huge portion of these eukaryotes. Protists, you can think of, for the most part, are single-celled eukaryotic organisms. Here's an example. This euglena is a protist. It's a single-celled eukaryotic organism. Any eukaryote is going to have internal compartments like these chloroplasts. Uh, there's a nucleus there. Even this structure is an organelle called an eye spot. It's equivalent to about 10% of your eye. It can't form an image, but it can tell the presence or the absence of light. So it can go to a light source or away from a light source. And that's helpful if you've got chloroplast. If you want to increase sugar production, you go towards the light. And if you want less sugar production, you go away from the light. Just as a science class overall, I'm reminded of some non-science classes that I took that I really enjoyed. I took a lot of philosophy classes and things that weren't science-based. And it seems if, if you go down those routes, and I, I encourage you to take as many different classes as you can, but it seems that uh, science classes and non-science classes, I'll say non-science classes that seek to explain the natural world, in science classes, they, they've got two ways of doing so. There is what's called natural knowledge, which is the, the 
path that science takes. It, it doesn't, I'll say it this way, there's, there's natural knowledge and then there's what's called revealed knowledge. If you've taken a philosophy class recently, then this might be more from, uh, recent. Revealed knowledge is knowledge that is passed down by word of mouth. Don't look at the date of the, the age of the rocks. Don't look at the evidence. Just believe what I'm telling you. This is revealed knowledge. And there's, the problem with that is that if we don't base ourselves on the experimental data, then these, these revealed knowledge stories, they can vary wildly. And uh, I'll, I'll give some examples of that. I'm reminded of growing up and being told the revealed knowledge story. Like, if you, if you don't base yourself off of the evidence, then you're left with, with stories like the Earth is around six or 7,000 years old because that's as far back as we can date people that we know. That's one way of doing it. But then you're left with when you date the rocks, like the limestone rock that you see out here, that dates to like 100 million years old. So you're left then with you know, either not accepting the evidence that comes in here and just selecting certain facts, or you know, if we go by natural knowledge, then we have to make sense of the age of those rocks out there. It's how we get 100 million year old age limestone. It's how we get the age of the earth at 4.6 billion years. It's how we get the age of the universe at about 13.8 billion years ago. Nobody knew that, but there's lines of evidence that suggest, there's multiple lines of evidence that point to the age of the earth being 4.6 billion uh, years old and the age of the universe being somewhere around 13.8 billion years old. Again, <sighs> revealed knowledge versus natural knowledge. Maybe a, let's boil this down to real life example. Here is an example of, of revealed knowledge that I remember hearing as a kid. And let me know if you've ever heard anything like this as well. Um, you know, we're in a room now where, look at everybody around the room, we're not exactly the same color, like our skin. Like I remember thinking, how is that possible? And there's actually stories I remember hearing, uh, revealed knowledge stories, non-scientific stories about, you know, suggestions as to why, how it is that we're not all exactly the sh same shade. You know, there has to be some explanation for that. And one uh, non-scientific explanation, so hang in there with me on this one, is uh, that at one point there were two brothers and one of them was not doing satisfactory things. So that individual got cast into the sun and their skin was burned and they were sent back down to earth and then all of their offspring also had this darkened skin. Now think about that for two seconds. That would be as if, that would be the same thing as saying uh, when I leave to drive home, if I get in a car wreck, and I somehow lose my left arm in that car wreck, then, then all of my offspring that I have after that are also going to be born with their, their arm missing. That's not how it works at all. So, um, you know, what's going on there? There has to be some type of biological explanation. And here it is, uh, if, if I can figure out how to draw this. Uh, let's, this is not going to be drawn to scale, but I'm just going to put the Earth here, and we're going to put the equator. zero degrees latitude. Up here at these equatorial regions, we've got 90 degrees latitude. The Earth is a curved surface. Uh, not drawn to scale, I'm going to put the sun in here. What's interesting about the sun is that you have radiating out from the sun in all directions these intense UV rays. UV rays. There's, uh, there's a double-edged sword with the UV rays. It turns out we need UV rays in order to develop proper vitamin D. Your skin grabs onto these UV rays and synthesizes its own vitamin D. So we need UV rays to, to have strong and healthy bones. Uh, the downside is that if we get too many UV rays, we'll say uh, too much, yeah, we get skin cancer. Yeah. Prolonged sunburns can lead to skin cancer. So, so there's something uh, about UV rays. I mean, clearly they're important. We need a certain amount of UV rays so that our bones develop properly. But too much UV rays is going to lead to skin cancer. So there has to be some type of local adaptation that can occur so that we get just the right amount of UV rays. And here's, I'm holding this thing so that we can give, it's the same uh, width all the way down. So 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this to represent the same amount of UV rays as it hits the equator. Let's just say UV rays. And we can see uh, these UV rays, as they hit the equator, they're spread over that much surface area of the, the globe. Let's put a person there hanging out at the equator, getting you know, these intense UV rays. I'm going to take the same amount of UV rays, uh, but we're going to let these UV rays hit somewhere closer towards the, the polar regions. If I can hold it. Same amount of UV rays. But these UV rays that hit closer towards these polar regions, look at how much more surface area that same quantity of UV rays gets spread out above. These are diluted UV rays. So the individuals that find themselves up at the polar regions are in a situation where there are, you know, there are very few UV rays. So what the body does, what the skin does to adapt is that uh, populations that are in the equatorial regions have more melanin in their skin. Melanin is a natural UV ray blocker. Populations that ended up adapting towards polar regions have fewer melanocytes in their skin because it's an adaptation to pick up as many UV rays as possible. The fact that we're different shades is nothing more than the fact that the earth is a curved surface and that we, we have spent different, your ancestors have spent time at different latitudes. So really you can just, by looking at me, you can get an idea of at what latitude my ancestors adapted to. Nothing less, I mean, nothing more than that. So um, local adaptation, right? And, and here's one example of that. So natural knowledge, there's a way of, of collecting data and, and making sense of the variation that we see that, that makes a lot more sense than some of the revealed explanations. Maybe I spent too, too much time going into that. But uh, we also are going to talk about this idea of sampling error. That in biology, you know, in any science, the more repeatable a, a test is, the more confident we are in those results. I'm going to kill that light because it's kind of washed out. But this, this student, we can see, is sampling a population of jelly beans. It looks like uh, there's a mixture of green and black jelly beans in here. And, you know, she's not going the revealed knowledge route. She's, she's actually testing, you know, natural knowledge. She's testing the environment and coming up with conclusions based off of the data that she collects. But you can see if the sample size is small, you wouldn't fault her for coming away with the conclusion that this entire population of jelly beans is green jelly beans. I mean, it, it, that hypothesis does, you know, it is backed up by her evidence. But if you're just getting one jelly bean, that doesn't give you a very large sample size at all. So the larger the sample size is, the less variation there will be. You can see in the second trial there with uh, an increased sample size, she gets a much better representative, uh, representation of the variation that's in the population. Uh, a mix of green and uh, black jelly beans there. But you can see from the starting picture, it's about an even mix of green and black jelly beans. You know, even if she collects 20 jelly beans, there's uh, a, just a random chance that she could be oversampling one particular type of jelly bean. So one way to reduce, you know, or, or one way to increase the confidence on this amount of jelly beans would be to, to increase the sample size even larger. So small sample size can sometimes lead to statistical errors. The larger the sample size, the more confident we are in the results. We did this last time, so um, maybe you have this already figured out, but uh, in, we've got two potential hypotheses here. Uh, I'll take this hypothesis one first. We have a situation here uh, where the lady has grabbed a flashlight. She's made an observation that the flashlight doesn't work when she turns it on, so she has to come up with hypotheses and it has to be something testable right she she can't just say you know God's making it tough on her today that may be but it's not something that she can test so she has to come up with testable questions and and one hypothesis here is maybe it's the battery that's dead what it, now remind me real quick how did we define a null hypothesis because I'm about to ask what a null hypothesis would be compared to this 
dead battery hypothesis. Mm. What are you thinking? I'm going to go ahead and say that both the hypothesis and null hypothesis can be true at the same time. Hmm. It's one or the other, usually in the null hypothesis. So, so the null hypothesis should be the exact opposite of what your, your generated hypothesis would be. Did I put that graph on the board last time? We were comparing masks and no masks. So we saw that, like... Um, a null hypothesis. Maybe I'll give this analogy. Like in the mask analogy that we were using last time, we basically said uh, whether masks are positive or negative, they either have an effect or they, they have no effect at all. Right? The null hypothesis, I think we said in our hypothesis that wearing a mask is going to reduce COVID. But the opposite of that was not that wearing a mask is going to increase COVID, because if that's the case, the mask is still having an effect. It can be either a positive or a negative effect, but if the mask is having an effect, uh, it's kind of early in the semester to get into relationship advice, especially for me, but uh, you know, thinking of it that, that way, that, that hate is not the opposite of love, right? Because if somebody hates you, there's at least emotion there. They're all stirred up. The opposite of love, like we said, is not hate. It's total indifference. It's having no effect at all. So in our mask example, the null hypothesis was having no effect at all. Okay, uh, back to this thing. The, the hypothesis here is that the battery is dead. So um, like we may have mentioned last time, the, the hypothesis is going to allow us to generate predictions. In this case, the hypothesis is the battery is dead, so we can make a prediction that if we change the battery, then that should make the problem go away. It, it, it should then work. So if our, hopefully we can read that, if the hypothesis is that the battery is dead, the batteries are the problem, then the null hypothesis would be the opposite of that, which is the batteries are not the problem. The batteries don't have any effect at all. Uh, if, if, like we said, we are assuming the batteries are the problem, we can make a prediction that if we fix the batteries, that's going to fix the problem. Our null hypothesis is that the batteries are not the problem. So if we fix the batteries, that's not going to fix the problem. Turns out, and you can see this dichotomy, one, the results are either we're going to support this alternative hypothesis. If we change the batteries, the light should work. Or we're going to support the null hypothesis, which is we change the batteries and that won't fix the problem. Turns out, if we can see down there, she did change the batteries and it did not fix the problem. So what we would say here is that the results supported the null hypothesis. We falsified the alternative hypothesis. Changing the batteries didn't change anything. So that's not what we had predicted. Uh, but, but changing the batteries, not changing anything, that is what was predicted by the null hypothesis. Let's try another one. If we look at this side, uh, we've got a, instead of thinking of the batteries as the problem, maybe it's the light bulb itself. Maybe the light bulb is bad. If that is our suggested hypothesis, the light bulb is bad, then we can make the prediction that by replacing the light bulb, that's going to fix the problem. So again, light bulb is the problem. Our null hypothesis would be the exact opposite of that, which would be the light bulb has no effect at all. And our prediction, if we fix the light bulb, it fixes the problem. The null hypothesis is if we fix the light bulb, it's not going to fix the problem. The light bulb doesn't have anything to do with it. In this case, she changes the light bulb and it does work. So we have falsified the null hypothesis and this alternative hypothesis has been supported. We're doing this because when we read these scientific papers, we see at the end of it, the results will always say something like, these results support the null hypothesis or these results support the alternative hypothesis. They falsify the null hypothesis. All right. I just wanted to say that we will be asking a lot of questions going forward. And, and here's, here's one of the first questions that we'll go ahead and ask. I'll leave it up because we had just been talking about this. That's a fruit fly. If you've had roommates like I've had where they leave food out, it might be uh, an insect that you've seen before. But let's, uh, let's do this. Let's put the 
chart on the board here where we are going to look at the number of flies, the number of those fruit flies, and we're going to compare that to how long those fruit flies can live without being fed any food. Uh, say hours without food. Make time go in this direction. Uh, before I put any numbers in there for, for hours without food, let me explain what's going on here. These are fruit flies. Uh, this is something that we're going to use as our example. Just as a starting point, I don't know if you can see the little yellow. There's like a yellow or orangish ball there in the abdomen. That's what's called a yolk sac, and it's present from birth. There's a certain amount of nutrients there that nourish this fly uh, after it's born until it eats its first meal. And like we said, with any population, there's variation in any population. There's variation in how much yolk is in that yolk sac in every individual fly that comes from a clutch of flies. So that means there's a varying amount of time that these flies can live before they have to have their first meal. What would you think on average, how many hours do you think these flies can live? Some flies are going to be better than others, obviously, but on average, what would, no penalty for wrong answer, take a stab at how many hours you think these flies can live with it. Uh, two, hours, six, six hours. two hours, six hours. Those are, it, six hours would be kind of on the low end of the range. It turns out uh, when, when they sampled a thousand of these flies, I'll just put it in there somewhere like this where the average fly was able to live for about 48 hours. So we'll put 48 hours. Uh, some of them died, you know, relatively early. We'll say 12 hours into it. Some of them were, were on the other phenotypic extreme, and they maybe lasted for like 72 hours before they, they died off. Uh, a buddy of mine named Jay Phelan did a study with these flies by creating a series of super flies that could live for like an hour, sorry, 160 hours before they were ever fed. So it was really kind of selecting for larger and larger yolk size in these flies. I'm going to explain that, but I'm going to let that sit there for a second. Before we talk about how they did that, how they made these superflies, let's review what evolution is in the first place because we know enough now to put a biological definition to it. It's not simply just a change over time, right? Uh, the, that fire, like we said, this, if I were to light your notes on fire and you light their notes, that's going to change over time. If we come back an hour from then, it may have burned that whole desk back there. So fires change over time, but they're not like the way that life changes over time because life, like we said, they have that genetic component, that, that DNA molecule that's passed down from one generation to the next. So instead of using this old school definition of change over time, our new biological definition of evolution can incorporate that genetic component. So let's just write that down. I'm going to get our, our first example out of the way. This first example is an example of, of natural selection, the habitat has already predetermined, you know, what ratio of melanin is the optimal to have at each individual latitude. Since we've been moving all over the place, you've got a, a, a whole scale of that. Okay, we are going to put our definition of evolution up. Let me get some different colors. Let's define uh, evolution as just a change in allele frequency within a population. We have to unpack that definition a little bit. Let's see, change in allele frequency. That'll be my abbreviation for frequency, and I'll say within a population. There's my abbreviation for population. Population, we talked about that last time. Our classroom is an example of a population. Uh, a population is a group of the same species, which we are, uh, in the same area at the same time. Same species, same area, same time. That's our population. 
Uh, allele, if we want to define that term allele, you can see it on the board here. Alleles are just different versions of a gene. Examples of alleles that we talked about last time were the different versions of the gene that build eyes. There was the brown allele, the blue allele, green allele, I think we even talked about a gray uh, version. So these different versions of how to build eyes are all alleles. And what's interesting, you can see how, you know, when the first genetic tests were coming back where we could compare different organisms to one another, it, it turns out that we have just above 50% of our DNA in common with a frog. That was a surprise to me. Because you're thinking, what do I have in common with a frog? Quite a lot, in fact. Like the, if you think about the body plan of a frog, they're the four limbs. You've got four limbs. It's got the same gene for building two eyeballs and for organizing the eyeballs on the face above the nose uh, and putting the mouth below the nose, the ears to the side. I mean, the, the organization of all of that is the same. When we look at our eye color, you can see the different versions of genes that build eyes. What's also interesting is that we can, we can look at what are called molecular fossils. We can go back to these different versions of genes, these different alleles, and we can see which ones have been around longer. If you're curious, it turns out brown eyes have been around longer than any of these other versions of eyes. These are more recent adaptations to populations moving closer towards the polar regions. And, well, we'll get into that too. We're going to put the four forces of evolution up. And what's crazy is that all four forces are working simultaneously. So there's the force of mutation that's, that's popping out these different versions of a gene. But then at the same time, you've got this force of selection that, that has to decide whether those, you know, which one of those versions is, is the right version to have in a given habitat. Like I said, I have, to, I have to avoid saying the words good or bad because like we said, what's good in one place is not good in all the other places. So we've got genes as segments of DNA that build something. Alleles as different versions of those genes. I think you have these in your class notes, but I'm just gonna put them on the board. I'm gonna remove my example of different alleles and I just wanna talk about where these alleles come from. Here are the forces that are constantly at work pulling on our population. I'm just going to put, well, I'll use this color. We'll use this red color as uh, our, to represent our population. So this is a group of individuals in the same place at the same time. And whether these individuals are aware of it or not, there are going to be forces that are pushing variation into the population. My arrows, this is just my way uh, for my brain to map out which of these four forces are adding variation. Uh, versus the, the forces over here that are pulling variation out of the population. So I'll put this on the side of forces that reduce variation. And just to be clear, by variation, we're talking about new alleles. Like it, when we just had brown eyes, how did we get blue eyes? How did we get green eyes? Where did those new versions of alleles come from? And then on the other side, we're going to see forces that are constantly taking out of the population these new alleles. So alleles can be removed as well. So we're setting the stage for the four forces. They're already up here behind me. So let's just list them on the board. We're going to go through and list uh, the four forces and which ones are random and, and which ones are non-random. The first one that we'll list on the board is mutation. It's on the side that increases variation. I said we can think of mutations as just a copying error. Mutations are copying errors, and like we said, we don't know ahead of time where a particular copying error is going to occur. So mutations are going to be one of these forces that we consider to be random. 
Again, I know I'm due for at least one more verbal mutation as we go through, but we don't know ahead of time where I'm going to make that verbal mutation. Um, all of the different new alleles, the different eye colors, all of those ultimately arose through a, a mutation. So if we're maybe making a special note next to mutation, you can say it is the ultimate source of new alleles. Because there is another source of new alleles. It's down here. It's just called gene flow. We can define gene flow as the movement of alleles into or out of a population. I'll, I'll maybe abbreviate that saying movement of alleles between populations. So movement of alleles between populations. This movement of alleles between populations is not going to be random. Let's put this as a non-random process. Um, I'm, I don't know that we got these four forces up on the board last time, but if we had, I would have pointed out gene flow. In fact, I can even still do this now. We've only had two days of class. Maybe when we show up for our third day of class, maybe there's somebody that's going to be sitting in that back chair that we haven't had before. So, I mean, it's not going to change our individual genetics, but as, a, as an entire gene pool, we can increase variation by, by getting new people to move into our population. But what individuals we get is not going to be completely random. I would give a higher probability um, for, for somebody to take that seat that is already a Temple College student or somebody that lives in Central Texas that needs college credits or is at least interested in a biology class. Those are pretty selective categories that would need, you know, the, all those boxes would need to be checked for somebody to be in that seat uh, versus any random person on the street. You know, it's, it's not against the laws of physics for somebody from upstate New York to, to sign up for this class and come down here and, and take the class even if they're like a writer. Maybe they just want to see what it's like to take an introductory biology class in 2022. And they could, they could certainly sit back there. And I would say that's less likely than a biology student that needs this for a credit. So movement of alleles between populations is not completely random. We can assign higher probability uh, or, or lower probability if there's like a mountain range or a big body of water. Or when I'm driving home, I see animals that get hit on the side of the road. A raccoon's trying to cross the road and, and doesn't make it. That road acted as a barrier to gene flow. How many roads do they have to cross? That could definitely hinder how easy it is for an allele to move in, you know, back and forth between populations. Fences are other things that hinder gene flow. Is there a hole in the fence? Or is it a really good high fence? That's going to affect gene flow. So there's all kind of things that go into this. It's not completely random. On the other side, that removes variation from population, one of these types of forces that remove variation, I'm going to get this out of the way to save myself a little space. Right at the top, we're going to list selection. Selection is going to come in three varieties. All three types of selection are going to remove variation from the population. And I'll go ahead and say they all do so in a non-random fashion. We, we know this already. We saw selection when we looked at the rabbit and fox populations. That was natural selection. We'll see in natural selection, the habitat has already predetermined what alleles are beneficial. Like we said, if it's a cold region, it's not random. It's going to be the ones that give you more fur, uh, stubbier limbs, and stubbier ears. In addition to natural selection, we're going to see two of the types of selection that, that work the same way. They reduce variation in a non-random way. We'll see artificial selection. Humans are going to determine what versions of alleles are beneficial. And then the last one is sexual selection. All three work the same by reducing variation in a non-random way. 12.30. What, what time is it that we have to take the break? One something? 1.45. 45, okay. I knew it was close. I can finish this. Uh, and then it'll be a nice time to transition between our lecture and lab stuff. So the last bit that we have to add here is our last force that reduces variation. 
And if you're keeping track, if half of these forces are random and the other half are non-random, we've got one more random force to introduce. And that's what's called genetic drift. Those sound a lot alike. Gene flow and genetic drift, they sound the same, but they are not at all the same. Genetic drift is on the side that reduces variation, and it reduces variation in a random way. Uh, where gene flow is increasing variation in a non-random way. So they're kind of polar opposites. The examples of genetic drift that we will see on a large scale are going to be what we call a bottleneck, population bottleneck, and then what is called a founder effect. Both of which are examples uh, in which a, a large amount of variation is lost randomly. Let's look at examples of each of those. Let me give a specific example of genetic drift just using a personal example, and then we're going to look at slides of each of these. Uh, I, I was showing this book last time that was called Selfish Gene, and, and we said it is a book that looks at each of us as a temporary vehicle built by those genes to carry the genes around and to get those genes into the next generation. And this thought of genetic drift, it is true that uh, if you think, you know, like think of me as this temporary vehicle. I've been around for 41 years, this temporary vehicle has, and I, I have no kids. So that means, and I'm fine with that, that saves me money. I can, you know, it's one positive thing. But uh, from my genes point of view, though, the genes don't like that. That means the genes would all die with me if I get taken out in a car wreck or something on the way home. But think of it this way. What if I'm lucky enough to find somebody to reproduce with? Then if that happens and I reproduce one time, I'm only getting only half of my genes are making it into the next temporary vehicle. And the other half are still going to die with me. So um, and, and it's also true that if I had a second kid, you don't get to decide Okay, I want, I want the 50% of my DNA that didn't make it into my first kid, I want that 50% to go into the second kid. You don't get to decide that way. It's just a random 50% of your DNA each time. So that means even if I had two kids, there's a good chance there's going to be a, a few of those genes that just didn't make it into the gamete and are going to die with me and with my little temporary vehicle. Even if I have 100 kids, there's a good chance that a few of those genes are just not ever going to make it into the gamete that are going to end up staying with me and, and we would lose those genes to genetic drift. So genetic drift is something that is more pronounced uh, the fewer times you reproduce basically. So wherever I'm. Interesting, interesting uh, individual aspect to, to thinking of genetic drift but there are also large-scale examples of genetic drift which we're going to see examples of each of these. Let's just start with uh, visual examples of mutations. We know this is a spelling error. It uh, leads to not only the verbal mutations that I use, but also differences in eye color, differences in fur color. These brown squirrels, there is a variation to their color pattern that led to darker fur. How did that darker fur arise? Well, it originally arose through some type of mutation. That mutation, if there is gene flow between two populations, then that dark mutation may spread to another population. Maybe, maybe somewhere on your notes, put a, put a special star next to gene flow because this is the glue that keeps populations the same or at least similar. If there's gene flow between two populations, then if some type of cool mutation shows up in one population, like black fur, then it's inevitably going to make its way over to the other population because we have movement of alleles back and forth between those two populations. So gene flow between two populations is going to keep them looking the same because anything that pops up in one population is going to make it over to the other population. On the same note, I guess the other side of that coin is that well, then if we can somehow stop gene flow, well, then these mutations that happen in one population stay in that population and are not shared with the other population. Uh, in fact, in, in this book, there is what I'm about to describe, I guess, is uh, we're talking about all of this, basically. 
This, I'll just, I know you can't really see it from the front, but uh, it's showing a series of pictures, and these are a series of butterfly. There, uh, if you look in the fossil record, there is an ancestral butterfly that lived in the interior part of the United States, northern Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, all of those areas. It goes back in the fossil record around 30,000 years ago. And in 30,000 years ago, there was only one species of butterfly. You can look, it had a similar type of wing pattern. But what happened after about 10, sorry, what happened after about 30,000 years ago, for about 20,000 years, there was a big ice sheet that came down from the north. And, and these glaciers, as they extended into the interior part of the United States, they split that butterfly population into an east coast and a west coast population. The butterflies can't live on top of the ice sheet, so they were separated into either living on the Florida coastline where it was warm enough, or living on the California coastline where it was warm enough. And now that this ice sheet has acted as a barrier to gene flow, these two populations, they adapt to their own local conditions. And it's not exactly the same type of breeding season, the same type of plants that they learn to feed on or lay their young on. And, and what happens slowly over the next 20,000 years as that ice sheet retreats, these, these now two separate populations, as they once again recolonize the central part of the United States, they have spent too long apart. They have too many, they have accumulated too many differences. And now that their home ranges overlap again, they don't breed at exactly the same time. They don't eat the same stuff. They don't live on the same types of plants anymore. They prefer different things. So it has, this barrier to gene flow for about 20,000 years has led to new species of butterfly where there was originally just one population. So stopping gene flow for long periods of time and allowing mutations to accumulate in these different populations can lead to drastic differences between those populations. If reproductive isolation is achieved between two populations, that's how we create new species. So gene flow, if there is gene flow between populations, we're not going to generate speciations. Let me say that again. There's a verbal mutation. Uh, if there is gene flow between populations, uh, we're not going to generate new species. It's going to keep those populations the same. However, if we can stop gene flow, then the timer has started for those accumulations to, to build up and then speciation be, be achieved. Okay. Mutations are copying errors. I should note that in asexually reproducing species, mutations are the only source of variation. In sexually reproducing species, there's individuals moving into and out of our population. Asexually reproducing species, mutation is the only source of variation. Here's a picture of gene flow. I keep using it as uh, describing this glue that, that keeps two populations the same. If we have movement of alleles back and forth between these two populations, eventually this green version is going to be shared over here, and we're going to have a population of green and brown beetles. You can also see how gene flow adds variation to a population. If we had gene flow over here, it would add variation, not take variation away by somebody moving into the population. And since there, um, there could be physical barriers that make this more difficult, we can say that it's a non-random process. It can be more difficult if there's additional barriers. Genetic drift. We said genetic drift is on the other side of the uh, table from gene flow. It's going to lead to a random loss of alleles, and there's two big kind of large-scale examples of that. The first large-scale example that we will see is called a population bottleneck. Let me grab my pointer. And in a population bottleneck, this is, is sad and it's devastating because in a bottleneck, we're going to lose about 90 to 95% of the original population. So this is devastating. There's some type of catastrophic event in a bottleneck that devastates the original population and leaves us with just a handful of survivors. And that changes up the frequency of alleles. You can see, again, evolution is just changing the frequency of alleles in a population. Our original frequency of alleles, it, it looks like about half blue, half white, and a mixture of yellow marbles in there. So there's some mixture of some diversity in there. But then after this population bottleneck, we have only a handful of surviving individuals. And those, the surviving individuals, this, is, this doesn't resemble exactly the, the frequency of alleles in the original population. We now have 
a frequency of alleles that's dominated by blue marbles, and we've completely lost the yellow marbles, and white marbles are now going to be underrepresented in our new population. Here's a real example of that. Has anybody ever uh, heard that joke, a seal walks into a club? No? It's, it's sad, isn't it? It's terrible. I don't like it, but that's the whole joke because it comes from a time when uh, people didn't have electricity, so in order to see at night, they would club seals. They would go, seals are mammals. They, these are northern elephant seals. They live off the coast of California. They, they spend most of their time out in the water, but when it comes time to have babies, the females have to come onto the beach and have their babies on the beach. Well, these pioneers, they, they knew what time of year they would come onto the beach and, and lay their pups. And they would go out on the beach with a lantern and a club and just clobber these seals. And they would obviously eat the meat and they would use the blubber to burn lamps and they can see in the night. This was all before electricity. Well, the population of elephant seals went from over 100,000 individuals to less than 100. And this was relative, you know, this was around the early 1900s. And it was due, again, to people clubbing seals on the beach. And it, it is an example of one of these massive bottlenecks because you had hundreds of thousands of these elephant seals and in just a few decades they went down to less than 100. So the original population is decimated, they're killed off. It also shows that, um, that the loss is completely random. It's not, it's not that the elephant seals that had the best genes were the ones that made it. Whether you were genetically strong or not had no bearing on whether you made it. it in the elephant seal example, it is likely the case that the, the larger males probably outcompeted the smaller males for access to the, the main beach in California. So the, the big males made it, they got the, the pristine beach, but that's also the beach where the humans come and, and clobber you. So the ones that made it to the mainland beach all got killed off, and the handful of survivors were actually these stragglers that were restricted to trying to reproduce on these isolated islands. The, the people couldn't get to them and club them there. So the individuals that survived these bottlenecks, it's kind of random. You can think of a meteor impact or a tsunami. Who survives those? It's completely random. It's not that, uh, like I said, having better genetic quality increases your likelihood at all. Uh, so in a bottleneck, like we said, there's devastation to the mainland population. The handful of individuals uh, have just a fraction of the variation. This was kind of a success story for conservation biology because after they were put on the endangered species list, it's been less than 100 years and they have rebounded to over 100,000 individuals. But since they have recently gone through that population bottleneck, they've lost a lot of their variation. Each one of those elephant seals is, is relatively, well, they are very genetically similar to one another. And that makes it... Yeah, any virus that, that's able to crack the code of one of them can crack the code of all of them. And that makes them vulnerable to diseases. And, and also, that's the other side of a, a new conservation biology story. There is populations of elephant seals that live in South America, the southern elephant seal. And there uh, is efforts underway for the past several decades to go down and collect these southern elephant seals, bring them to the northern elephant seal population, and infuse some variation into this population. I mean, that's the old school way of doing it. I guess now they can even write artificial chromosomes and put it in there. It's crazy, the types of stuff that's going on. But this is our example of a bottleneck where we lost variation because the original population got killed off except for a handful of individuals. That's how we can lose variation. Notice that this slide is labeled founder effect, but it's using the same picture. I need to make a distinction here. In founder effect, the original population is not killed off. They are still located wherever they've always been. Uh, all that happens in a founder effect is that a handful of individuals, a, there's another verbal mutation, a handful of individuals leave the mainland population and start a new population somewhere else. So the, with just a handful of individuals that leave, this changes the frequency of alleles in the new population. Again, a, a loss of a bunch of variation uh, but in this case, the original population, like we said, there's no catastrophic event that kills them off. They stay put. 
It's just a, a few individuals break away and establish new population somewhere else. Like if the three of us just left and we decided to go into the chemistry lab and, and that's going to be our population, if we counted up the frequency of alleles, we would have less variation or at least a different frequency of alleles than we had when we looked at the entire group. Once again, at a gene pool level, these frequency of alleles can fluctuate. All of these forces are constantly at work, whereas individuals were genetically fixed. Let's look at selection real quick because it's the last one that we have to tour. There are three types of selection. Let's look at uh, natural selection first. If you're writing, I can't remember if I put this in the notes for you or not. It might just say natural selection. Uh, but natural selection is going to be a case where the habitat determines what alleles are beneficial or not. In artificial selection, we're going to see that it's humans that determine what traits are beneficial. And in sexual selection, it's females that determine what traits are beneficial. Here's an example of natural selection. We've seen this a couple of times. I used the, the rabbit and the fox populations showing where these habitats are already determining what variation is going to be beneficial to have. Uh, here's maybe a, the, the additional example. Is it, has anybody ever driven through New Mexico, like the interior part of New Mexico, where if you blink, you'll miss it? It's, it's all limestone rock like this. And again, if you date that limestone rock, it dates to about 120 million years old. But that limestone rock, about 35 million years ago got ripped apart. These uh, geologic forces pulled the tectonic plates apart. It separated in West Texas and also in New Mexico. So magma, 35 million year old magma, came up to the surface and cooled off. And it created this little stretch in New Mexico called the Valley of Fire. Has anybody ever gone through that? It's, it's all limestone rock. And then all of a sudden for just a few miles, it's this black lava rock. And I used to, with my grandfather, we would get out and grab these big chunks of lava rock. And it was these big rocks that was really light because it just had a bunch of pockets of hollow spaces inside. But what's interesting is that you have, in the middle of this tan desert, you have this patch of dark lava rock. And it provides a completely different selective pressure on the mice population that live there. Forever, the mice had become adapted to this local tan-colored background, but now there's a new selective pressure. It's going to favor a different type of uh, coat pattern on these mice. Now the darker the fur is, the better you blend in. Owls are the natural predators of these um, mice. Let's see if this video is loaded. I spring loaded some very short videos so that we can see this in motion. Oh, there's New Mexico. Sandy colored landscape until some lava flows happen. That lava cools. And now that black rock is going to be invaded by the sandy colored mice. Once every thousand years or so, a black mouse is going to pop up. The owls are going to be there circling overhead for eons. And if we start with a population where just one mouse is black and it has just a 1% advantage, watch what happens over the generations. But in about a thousand generations, 95% of the mice will be black. That's just natural selection doing the work. One mutation, one founding mutation can spread to 95% of the population in a thousand generations. Now what happens if there's a 10% advantage of being black? Very quick. In a hundred generations, 95% of the mice. Now I'm going to stop that real quick. I mean, it's, it's show, what this is basically showing is that if there is a mutation that is beneficial, then it is going to quickly sweep through the entire population very quickly. I need to add something to that too. This idea of beneficial traits sweeping through the population very quickly. Uh, this is an idea that we are going to refer to as, as the Red Queen. Has anybody heard of the Red Queen? Did we talk about the Red Queen at all last time? Nothing? Um, this Red Queen analogy comes from that Alice in the Wonderland book where there is, uh, there's a Red Queen and then Alice in this Alice in Wonderland thing, uh, she's in this room next to the Red Queen and they're just running as fast as they can. It's like they're on this treadmill where the ground is moving. 
Uh, but the wall, like nothing around them seems to be moving, but they're running as fast as they can. And uh, the, the Alice turns to the Red Queen and is like, this is crazy. This is weird that we're running as fast as we can and we're staying in the same place. And the Red Queen turns to her and says, that's exactly right. You have to run as fast as you can just to stay in the same place. That is a perfect analogy for what we're talking about here. Animals are constantly having to adapt to stay in existence, to claim their spot. Um, you, you hear this like after the Super Bowl when, uh, or, or whatever the top athletes, you know, after they win whatever they're trying to win, you know, th they'll be interviewed and they'll say, what are you going to do now that, that you've got an off season? They, a common answer is something like, well, I got to keep working out. I got, you know, if I take a day off, then everybody else is going to gain ground on me. You got to constantly stay moving just to stay in the same place. We're constantly adapting just to stay in the same place. I, I will, I'll use the cell phone as an example of a beneficial trait. There was a time I remember working at an office building where nobody had a phone that got emails. Since nobody had a phone that got emails, it, you weren't at a disadvantage if you didn't have a phone that got emails. But whenever the first person at the office got a phone that could respond to emails, that one person now was way more productive than anybody else. And to keep up, you also had to go get a cell phone that got emails or could at least send text messages. And so everybody had to, to catch up to stay just as productive. I bet I could, I usually, I think we're now at a time where this is probably swept completely through the population. Does everybody here have a phone that can get emails now? I think just about everybody. So that's something that's now, again, if it's beneficial, it will sweep through the entire population. Let's... Let's go away from natural selection and let's look real quick at artificial selection. This is a case where the habitat isn't determining which genes are beneficial, but humans are. And this is done with dog breeding. This is maybe the best example, uh, but it's also done with agricultural crops. This is a picture of the ancestor to corn. It's called the Tiacente plant. You can see it's kind of grassy-like. The corn kernels, there's like maybe 10 of them total there. But if you were to grow entire fields of this tiacente, there would be variation. Some plants would have a few more kernels than others. And over thousands of years of selection for the, the ones that produce the highest yield, it has ended up giving us our modern corn plant, which doesn't even closely resemble this wild tiacente plant anymore. Um, let's look at this short video with dogs. This lady is uh, pretty extreme when it comes to dog breeding, but let's listen to this. Dogs vary in all sorts of interesting traits, colors, hair textures, sizes, behaviors that are interesting and useful to humans. DNA studies suggest that all those different modern dog breeds are uh, derived from wolves. Wolves have lived near humans for thousands of years. And the earliest archaeological evidence of domesticated uh, forms of wolves or dogs is found about 10,000 years ago in human settlement. At that time, the skeletons of domesticated dogs looked fairly uniform and similar to wolves. By the time of the Egyptians, you can see these specialized breeds being developed that have long limbs and long muzzles. That uh, breed actually still lives today in an ancient breed called the Saluki. Other breeds have been developed for hunting, retrieving, herding animals. Pointers and retrievers and sheepdogs are great examples of taking ancestral uh, tracking and hunting behaviors that were present uh, in wolves and turning them in to selected behaviors that are useful for humans. So how is it possible to take an ancestral animal and turn it into this broad diversity of different uh, forms? Let's actually uh, listen to a couple of human dog breeders describe how they look at an animal and how they decide what it is they want to do. I think that his neck is a little bit too short. He's got great strength in the neck, but I'd like to have it just a smidgen longer. Um, I also would like to have a little more muscle definition in the rear. We really enjoy the ability to take the gene pool and use it like paints. It's, it's our art. This is my art. I made this beautiful dog that I enjoy. I made her. I chose her sire and her dam. I chose several generations to make this beautiful dog. I'm very proud of her. Yeah, that's pretty extreme. So. Artificial selection. It's a case that the humans are determining which versions of genes are beneficial or not. Not, not the animals. My other example of that is I 
being from Cameron, I dated a girl that has, her family has turkey farms. If you've driven through Cameron and seen turkey farms, probably those. And uh, if you are a turkey farmer, how much money you make is tied to how much money you get per turkey. And they're selling these turkeys for their breast meat. So you are interested in the genes that are going to give your turkeys the largest breast size. You don't, it's not random which ones you want. You want, that's what you're looking for so that you can make the most money. So they have selected artificially for these turkeys now that have Males and females have, have breasts that are so large they can't physically get together and reproduce the natural way. They have to artificially inseminate all of the female turkeys. And again, that's not good for the animals, but it's only good for the humans that need a bunch of turkey meat, like making turkey sandwiches. We're only going to watch less than two minutes of this one, but it shows that uh, not only animals, but plants have been pulled in different directions by humans, and it's led to, in this case, a wide variety of table vegetables that all have their common ancestry in one type of plant. Let's, anyway, let's get this out of the way. We've got one more short video to watch because the last type of selection that we need to introduce is sexual selection. And what's very interesting about this is that it runs... It's almost counterintuitive to natural selection. We've just been saying in natural selection that it's the habitat that shapes the organism. And that's true, the habitat shapes the organism, but if males and females live in the same habitat, why is it that these ornaments only appear on males and not females? Ornaments like, well, the big feathers on male peacocks. You don't find those on female peacocks. I use the example of uh, my dad and uncles like to hunt big deer antlers. Those big deer antlers, those ornaments are only on males and not the females. You can think of the lion's mane that's only on males and not the females. Why is it that there are differences between males and females? If they live in the same habitat, you would expect the habitat to shape them the same way. And I'll share this last little thing, and then we're going to run and take our break. But I remember growing up and my aunt telling me as a little kid, you know, Chad, humans are different from animals because uh, humans have reasons for what we do, and animals have instincts, and, and we don't have any instincts. And I remember thinking, that's probably BS. I just didn't have an example to counter that at the time. And, uh, and here is your example to show you that you have an instinct. It's sexual selection as well. Um, I'll use, let me use a bird analogy first. Has anybody seen those uh, like cardinal birds, the males are the bright red showy ones and then the females are, they've got a little bit of red to them but they're mostly kind of brown colored. The, the, how bright red the males are, they're not born super bright red. They're, they have to, it, depending on the quality of food that they ingest and, and the metabolic pathways inside their body that takes that food and builds the red pigment out of it, if they're very healthy, they're going to be a brighter red. And females, they prefer the ones that are brighter red than, than the more drab colored, less red males. Females, those female cardinal birds, maybe they just like the way the red color looks. They don't know that, that there's... Uh, that that bright red color is tied to genetic quality. Here's the instinct that you have uh, that you might not know. You can smell the genetic compatibility in a mate. Yeah, um, you just might like the way somebody smells and you don't know you're actually selecting for genetic compatibility. Just like those birds, they might like the way that a certain red color looks, they're, they're selecting for genetic quality. And here's how they, the study I'm describing has been repeated multiple times so that the sample size is large and repeatable. One study they did, uh, this study requires 50 males and 50 females to get their genes sequenced and they never meet. So the, it starts out with 50 males, they, are, they have their immune genes sequenced and then they spend a week sleeping in one of these white t-shirts. The shirt just has a number one through 50. It's associated with their given number for the study. Uh, in a second version of this study, they had males do the same thing. 50 males play basketball in one of these white shirts for a few hours and infuse the shirt with their own sweat, their own body odor. And then after they were done, the males put their sweaty t-shirts in a Ziploc bag labeled one through 50 and they're gone. Then the females come into the room. They never see the males. Each female has their opportunity to grab each bag and smell the body odor of the shirt. And, and they ranked the shirts from most appealing smell to least appealing smell. And what was interesting is they were consistently finding that females were ranking males higher. Uh, 
how can I say that? The males that were ranking higher were the ones that had different immune genes than, than their own. So what that makes sense from an evolutionary point of view, what you are doing by selecting, you know, just through smell, you can tell something about the different suite of immune genes an individual has. And if you reproduce with somebody that has drastically different immune genes than your own, then you're ensuring that your offspring has the greatest variety of immune genes versus, you know, reproducing with somebody that's got the same exact set of immune genes as you, that's not going to give your offspring much diversity. So you can, and obviously when we put on body spray and perfume, that probably messes all of that up. But genetically, you come with ability to smell genetic compatibility in a mate. Let's take a break. I know I've taken too much of your time already, so I promise a very short lab period on the other side of this break. We'll start by explaining what, what happens. How can we make these superflies? So let me jump into this. This is the last slide that we have to talk about, and we've already seen it. And it's just this uh, comparison of how we can develop these superflies. And here's the example that I'm going to give. Um, use this color. These fruit flies were used as a study. This was done by one of my buddies named Jay Phelan. He teaches at UCLA. Uh, and he did this study developing these super flies. And like I said, each fruit fly comes with its own little yolk sac that it's born with. And with any population, there's variation. So some of these flies are born with just a tiny yolk sac and they die, you know, 12 hours uh, after being born if they don't have any food. Some of them uh, are on the other phenotypic extreme end where they have a large yolk sac where they can last almost 72 hours before they die. Here's the experiment. Imagine we had a thousand of these flies in a glass little closed in box. So they can't leave the box. And what we're doing inside there is we just let a clutch of a thousand of these flies hatch and we watch them fly around and then slowly after several hours they start dying off. These flies, they feed on fruit, potato skins, anything like that. And what happened the first The first generation of flies, like I said, wild flies collected initially, they were lasting about 48 hours on average before they started to die off. But what Jay did is he, he wanted to put a strong selective pressure on this population of flies. And where I'm going with this analogy is I'm trying to show that you've, now that we've introduced these forces of evolution, all four of these forces are working simultaneously. You don't have one without the other. They're all working together on these allele frequencies. And so for the purposes of these flies, like we said, all he did was wait until about hour 70 when 95% of the population had died off. And just the handful of extreme individuals are, are the ones that made it. They've survived until hour 70. And right at hour 70, he dropped a banana peel in there. So these extreme individuals that were still alive at hour 70, now they've got a banana peel. They crawl over to the banana peel, they eat some food, they feel better, and then they turn around and reproduce with whoever else is still alive. And whoever else is alive are those also extreme individuals that had a large amount of yolk to start off with. So he lets this second generation of flies grow in this, again, a closed-in box. That second generation of flies when looked at, on average, the average fly in this population was living about 50 hours before it died. Again, some were dying off at about 14 hours. Some were making it to about 74 hours before they died off. That's the second generation. So he let this second generation go until about hour 72, and then he dropped in another potato peel, or whatever, banana peel. Bananas or potatoes are their main food. So again, this second generation of extreme survivors now had a banana peel to crawl to. They get some food. They turn around and reproduce with the individuals that also survived. And each generation, we see this slow, steady march of individuals increasing the amount of time that they can spend before they get their first meal. This is an example. So what we've got going on here, each time that we do this, we are, are basically creating a bottleneck where most of the population is killed off and only a handful of individuals survive. 
We can also, we have strong artificial selection going on here because humans are deciding, oh, I want to make a fly that lives a long time, you know, without being fed. They've also done these selective pressures by giving flies, getting them used to larger and larger doses of alcohol. And that's also pretty crazy uh, how you can make these super flies that can consume large amounts of alcohol. But again, it's artificial selection. The humans decide what trait they're going to go after. Mutations are constantly happening uh, in insect populations that have thousands of individuals every generation and have a generation every two weeks. This speeds up generation. This speeds up mutation rates because you have multiple generations. If you like to see multiple generations and, and rapid mutation rates, then you want to study things like insects that have these rapid uh, turnarounds. Something like studying mammals or, or blue whales or elephants, something that has a, a very long turnaround time from one generation to the next, takes a lot longer to study. So flies are a good um, model organism to do this to. And this study was done, I've just gone through uh, three generations of this, but this was a study that was passed off to other graduate students and was run over uh, 50 generations. And I don't have enough room on the board to write the results of this, but what they ended up producing is a fly population whose average number of hours that they could live before they were fed was 160 hours. Superflies, they, they don't even, the, you know, these extremes don't even overlap from the original population. Now here's another question. These are the superfly populations that we've created through several generations, through many generations of these intense selective pressures. What would happen if we had a crack in the side of the box and some wild, wild fruit flies were getting in there? What would that do to this average? It would, it would bring us back down to the normal range. So that shows us if we want to get differences between populations, we've got to stop gene flow. Now those differences can start to accumulate. If, if there ever is gene flow that's, that's reopened between populations, it's going to start to make these populations look similar. They're going to converge on an average.